case for me to be happy. <laughs> Anybody who needs to go to the restroom before we continue? <coughs> okay. Namodasa Bhagavatu Arahatu Sama Samudasa Namodasa Bhagavatu Arahatu Sama Samudasa Anamodasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samudasa Murang Namang Sangang Namasami Here, you're coming here once a month and some of you are here staying <laughs> and uh, when you came into this room or in this monastery what did you notice did you notice the mats the people the shrine maybe did you also notice the one thing in this room that's the biggest thing in this room? And I'm not talking about the uh, fake 18th century painting in the back. <laughs> <laughs> the space is the biggest thing in this room. But we usually don't tend to pay attention to that. Yet it's the space that defines everything. Without space, well, this would be a black hole and life would not be very pleasant. But we tend not to notice it. So just for one minute, just close your eyes and see what it feels like. What this space feels like. That's also a good practice that you can do throughout the day. Like when you come home, you close the door. Normally you probably go and rush and do all kinds of things. Get yourself a cup of tea or put the groceries away or whatever you're doing. But just stop for just a minute and see what it feels like. And after a while, if you do this, you you'll notice that every space feels a little bit different. You become more aware of the subtle differences that are there. All these things are it's mindfulness practices as well. If I speak quite slowly, like this. You might notice that when your mind is paying attention to the spaces between my words, your mind actually becomes still. You have no thoughts. Because you're really trying to focus on what I'm saying. And it's the same with the space. If you come into a space and if you just feel the space, your mind becomes still. In your meditation, you can also use it if you're using the mindfulness of breathing, the spaces between the in breath and the out breath, and the out breath and the in breath, and see if you can catch those. Or make it into a little game. And then you can really become mindful very quickly. Now, one of my favorite suttas is the Chula Sunya Sutta, that's Majjhima Nikaya 121. It's a smaller discourse on emptiness. 
Um, that's also about seeing what is missing. And it's a very important practice, actually. It's a very, uh, very wonderful practice to, to, to start with because um, it, 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 your mind can become still quite quickly that way. Um, so let me tell you what this sutta is about. So the Buddha is talking to his attendant, Ananda, and uh, he's talking about uh, abiding in emptiness and what that means. And uh, so he, he says now, well, for instance, if you, um, if you come from the village to a monastery, and you notice that it's, it's different and you all come from outside somewhere. So what was it like coming from outside? You maybe have a busy life and then you come here and uh, it's, it's different. It's like for these one and a half hours, you have nothing much to do just to sit here. Be, you're here for yourself. You don't have to do anything. That's actually quite good. Otherwise you wouldn't be coming here. <laughs> so, just to, to observe what is missing. Oh, your busy life. All the things you have to do, all these worries and problems that you have to solve. They're not there for just this one and a half hours and that feels really good. You have to really feel that and that really helpful in, the, in your practice as well. So yeah, the Buddha also says, and if you come from a big city like New York, I'm pretty sure that's quite different as well. <laughs> I uh, um, stayed at the Rockaway Center before uh, this one was, was um, this monastery was established. And um, then we had teachings uh, sometimes in the evenings in Brooklyn and Manhattan. And I'd never been to New York before. And so we went there on the underground and uh, we'd come back quite late. And yeah, I had heard people saying, oh, New York's the city that never sleeps. And it's really true. <laughs> And it was so much noise. I come from a countryside. I had not really, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd never really uh, expected it to be so much noise. And for me, it was actually quite tiring. And then coming back to the center in Rockaway, it was nice and quiet again. And I could reflect on what was missing was all this noise of the trains, the people. And well, that's what the Buddha talks about as well. He talks about, um, uh, this monk coming from the village and in the village there's people there's elephants and they have those of course in the time of the buddha in villages not anymore today but uh and yeah you can feel in the blind state we have cars and, and and other things that make noise so and you come to the monastery and in the monastery it's nice and quiet and then you can observe like what does that feel like to just be in the silence. This this place is also very silent. Maybe, we, I don't know where you come from, but I guess some of you come from a more busy place, and part of the city or, uh, and all that noise, that's not there. And that's actually really nice. How does that feel? But if you live here a little bit longer, as some of you do in this monastery, at some point you begin to forget what it's like out there. And sometimes this, there's this one story, I don't quite know where it comes from, it's a Christian story. Um, it says that um, uh, if people will all go to heaven, uh, then once a year they all have to go to hell just to appreciate heaven again. Hmm. So sometimes it's good to, this is one thing that Ajahn Brahm does, it's like we're having the uh, three months range retreat in um, the, the, what do you call the Vasa. And um, uh, there's uh, also lay people that come and stay there. And um, if anybody, um, lay or monastic, has some problem during that Vasa that they are too bored, it's like nothing's happening, it's too silent. He sends them for some errand to the shopping mall. And then they come back, it's like, oh gosh, it's so good to be back. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so it's it's for those of you who are staying longer it's 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 sometimes good to uh go back and then you really appreciate the monastery again so if you feel that you stop appreciating the monastery just do that and <laughs> okay so but then there's also the monastery itself and in its present moment that still like some disturbances there so you're aware that there's a lot missing but there's still something there there's other people that might be talking or uh, this this house is a bit old so the floorboards are creaking and people are walking and uh, the heating sometimes makes a noise or whatever it is that's still there and you're aware of that and that's okay but then um, in the you know story in this uh, Majmanikaya uh, story in the Chula Sunyata um, Sutta uh, the monk then goes to the wilderness and um, then he also reflects so all those noises from the monastery they are not there anymore but there's also the noises of the wilderness and if you are those are still there and if anybody has ever been in a tropical country in a, in a rainforest that can be a lot of noise, especially at night. Somewhere around uh, noon time when it gets really hot, everything tends to calm down. But at, no at, at night it can be enormous noise still. So all the uh, birds and uh, creatures and insects that are there. Uh, I remember one time I was staying in uh, Australia in Santi Forest Monastery. That's the south of Sydney. And uh, I came back from somewhere I think visiting my parents and uh, uh, I noticed something had changed. It was very hard to miss. There were all these cicadas that had woken up and that only happens once every five years apparently. But it was so much noise that you had to shout to people to make yourself heard, even if they were standing very close to you. And that noise would go on from, uh, sun, um, from sunrise to sunset and then they've become quiet and that was so blissful that one hour after the sunset was so blissful it's, it's nice and quiet <laughs> so yeah you can observe that what is still there or what is missing and then the the uh, the, the sutta goes on with uh, with that the monk starts to meditate goes inside and you might notice also that if you're like well you're listening to me if well I haven't really noticed any other noises myself actually it's quite quiet here but um, if there's something like somebody walking around or there's a car coming by you probably won't notice that because you're listening to me right now so your mind doesn't particularly go in that direction um, so it's the same thing if you really go inside it in your, your meditation in all those outside noises okay I had a little bit of difficulty with the cicadas there because they're really loud but usually all those outside noises tend to sort of slowly disappear and um, because you're going inside and you're not paying attention to them anymore so you're not tending to yeah, attending to them so much anymore. Um, Ajahn Chah was um, uh, a great Thai forest master. Um, he, um, uh, you yeah, know, there was a, a, a time when the, uh, yeah, the, the monastery was actually built in, in the wilderness, but yeah, slowly um, civilization came closer and closer to the monastery and uh, the, the villagers liked to have a lot of parties and what they would do is they would crank up the volume to the maximum of uh, these big speakers and then go on till like two o'clock in the morning while like the monks schedule is that like at three o'clock in the morning they have to get up so the monks weren't too happy about this and uh, yeah they only like like one hour sleep uh, a night sort of and these, these parties would go on for for uh, for days sometimes so he, they went to Ajahn Shah and they asked like oh, can you please please tell these villagers to at least stop at one o'clock so we can at least have two hours sleep 
And Ajahn Chah just looked at them and said, well, don't disturb the noise. <laughs> and uh, that's a very important teaching, actually. Ajahn Chah had all these, these wonderful ways of, of teaching in very simple ways. And um, this is actually what we do. We are sending our mind out to the noise. It goes almost automatic, but we don't have to do that. As long as we, uh, when we become aware of that, we can learn to train ourselves to bring the mind back um, into our body, into our meditation, uh, and not go out to look for it. Um, <coughs> there is something to be said for that because it's actually a survival mechanism. Uh, because uh, our even when we're sleeping, there's part of us that's still sort of aware what's going on. And if there is danger, then especially if you're living out in the wilderness, of course, in, uh, in, in ancient times, then um, it, like when there is a noise, it's, it's important that you wake up quickly. So the sound is the most difficult one to actually shut off. Uh, but any, uh, the same actually counts for, for the eyes uh, also when we close our eyes in meditation, but that's an easy one to close off. The ears are a bit more difficult. You can try and have earplugs in or something like that, but often that doesn't quite work either. But you can try if that helps you, why not? So, um, yeah, so you go inside and then what? Okay, the noise of the, of the sounds of the, the forest or wherever you are might disappear a bit. But then there's your thoughts. That can make a lot of noise. Um, that's quite often people's biggest problem in meditation is like, what to do with all these thoughts? And yeah, it's, it's um, you also have to look at this this way. You have, you've been busy all day, maybe, and your mind is still working. It needs some time to settle down. So you first of all, you have to have patience with your mind, not get upset with your mind, because then you just add anger to it and that doesn't work either. So if, just accept that this is your mind right now. And that doesn't mean that you have to go and uh, think whatever you want to think, but just take a little bit of distance. As I, okay, this, I have thought, this is a mind with thoughts right now and having be aware of that and have this loving kindness towards that as well and then slowly slowly you'll find that it tends to calm down a little bit more and you just continue with the meditation and every time in every stage you can notice like oh what is still there and what is now missing and in the in the sutta it actually continues a lot further than um it goes all the way to enlightenment. So if you want to read that, then please do. It's a, it's a lovely sutta. Um, so and then, of course, in the Arahant stage, uh, at the end, there's no more defilements. So no more, uh, nothing that bothers me anymore in meditation. And no more uh, greed, hatred and delusion. So that's what the whole sutta is about. Um, I, I really love this sutta because it really speaks to me and I find it very helpful in my own practice. To at least sit down and just observe the space and just observe what is there. And I do want to say one thing about um, emotions as well, because that's another thing why we often have a lot of thoughts if there's like strong emotions. And that's another thing that you can do with these emotions is to go inside and see where you feel them. This is a feely feely pass, if I can say it that way. It's all about feeling, about experiencing things. We can read lots of books we can, about Buddhism, we can know everything about Buddhism, we can give enormously good Dhamma talks, but if you don't practice, uh, you're not going to really make any progress. 
Um, I remember in my, my very, very first Dhamma talk I ever heard, uh, I was living on this tiny little island with, with 500 people. And uh, on the next island, there was a tiny little Zen center and they had this, this, um, this teacher coming. And so this teacher gave this talk and it was a really, really good talk. And in the break, people asked, um, uh, it was a professor, I think, also at the university. And uh, uh, in the break, people uh, asked him, like, how long, how many years have you already been meditating? And he said, oh, I don't have time for meditation. <laughs> <laughs> so don't always go from, like, the Dhamma talks can be inspiring. Uh, reading suttas can be inspiring, um, but your, your own practice, that's what it's about. And that's also about feeling what's going on inside of you, coming in contact with these feelings. So if you're having these emotions that are very strong, you can try and distance yourself a little bit by looking at where you feel these in your body anyway. And then just stay with that, those feelings and with this love and kindness and mindfulness um, because they're not really you they're not your um, they're not your your property it, it, it's a, a, a you're conditioned in a certain way you can't help it if these emotions come up you can't force them to stay down but you can have love and kindness towards them and towards yourself and stay with that and then you'll notice that after a while these emotions start to die down a little bit and you're starting to feel a little bit better. It's not always easy, but it takes, takes a little bit of practice. And as with everything, you've been conditioned for your whole life and probably previous lives uh, to be in a certain way. And what we're doing now with the meditation is to uncondition that. That takes time or condition it in a different direction in any case. And that takes a lot of time and we, we have to be very mindful and be, be really aware of what we're doing. Um, and yeah, it takes, takes time and, and a lot of practice, but it's well worth it. And if you look back in your life in the last month, year, two years, three years, however long you've been practicing, and then you see like how much you have already changed. How much the Buddhist teachings have helped you, how much your meditation have helped you. And that is also very inspiring. If ever you feel like, oh, I'm not getting anywhere, look back at, at that and you go, oh, that I, I actually have been doing okay. I used to be this very, whatever, angry person or upset person, or and now I'm much better. So I'm much more happy. Of course, we're not happy all the time, but yeah, but relatively more happy. Then you can also find inspiration in that and be like, okay, that's that's I'm not too bad. I can stay with this with this love and kindness. So do do whatever you need to do to have this love and kindness coming up for yourself. All right, I think I'll leave it at that and then see what kind of questions there are, and if. Yeah, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about what's alive for you. We can say uh, three sadhus all together. <coughs> sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Lady in the back there, what's your name? Cheryl. Cheryl, what's your question? What's your question, Cheryl? It wasn't a question, it was more of an observation during the meditation. Um, I, I definitely heard you saying, you know, as we're inhaling, we're smiling. Mm. And it, it was making me think that that was an automatic thing, but I found that I couldn't smile. Mm. It has to do with um, what we said before during the, the relaxation. If you uh, relax all the muscles in your mind, you get a smile. So I smiled when I opened my eyes and saw the cat. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever works. <laughs> yeah, it's it's 
um, it's also something to to remind us as if I said if, if um, this is a meditation by by Thich Nhat Hanh actually is quite a famous uh, famous one so those of you who uh, uh, know Thich Nhat Hanh know this meditation probably because he does it often and um, yeah when you relax all those those muscles uh, the, the smile comes so that's why I say um, uh, I breathe in and I smile and it's also a reminder of that it's like oh yeah I'm gonna smile this enjoy the meditation <laughs> I was relating it to um, to the day today where I was particularly kind of sad mm. and so I, I guess that thought was I can't smile or I won't smile mm. Well, you've noticed that in yourself, that tendency. So that that's that's really good. You've been mindful enough to see it's like, oh, there's part of me that doesn't want to smile because I've had a terrible day. <laughs> but then you smiled anyway when you saw the cat. <laughs> <laughs> Question? What's your oh, name? My name is Nick. Hi, Nick. Yeah. So, um, I'd like to go back to uh, what you said about uh, when, uh, in order to, uh, for the people that go to heaven, they have to go to hell once a year. I relate that to uh, to the weather uh, and the uh, seasons. If you would, uh, I've always been a summer person, but in order for me to appreciate the summer, mm. I have to, uh, we will all have to visit the winter. And, mm. uh, and suffer through the cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, actually, I started appreciating the seasons when I was I was in Australia for two years, and their seasons are very different. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's extremely hot, or hot and wet, and that was sort of it. It was very different seasons than we have here. And, and we have in Europe, I come from Europe. Um, and I really started appreciating Europe again. <laughs> but yeah, we can, can, can look at that. And especially, uh, I also stayed some time in um, uh, a monastery in the, in the Alps in, in, uh, in the south of Germany. And um, yeah, in the, in the winter, we were basically snowed in. We had a winter retreat from January to March, and we were basically snowed in for three months. And the first time you see snow, you go like, yay, it's snow, wonderful. And, and even when it's a lot of snow, it's like, oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> we could try out this, this new tractor that we're having with the, the show, snow shovel. And, but after three months, you're pretty sick of it. <laughs> so yeah, and then you're, very happy to see the sun again and to see it melt again and to be able to go for a walk again. <laughs> mm -hmm. It became so bad at some point that uh, um, like it, even our, our grocery deliveries couldn't get up the hill to deliver to us. So they had to deliver it to uh, the farm down, uh, down the hill and they would bring it up with their tractor. Uh, and at some point, our, our sh uh, tractor snow shovel froze. That's how cold it was. Like the diesel froze. So the other neighbor came and they had something that, something, a heat pad or something that they had, especially for tractors, I didn't know it existed, that they put underneath there to uh, defrost it. So we had all kinds of little adventures there. <laughs> but yeah, I was glad it was over. <laughs> What's your um, name? Your beans. Yeah. Beans. I really like what you were saying about the, the noises and things. Um, cause it, just today I was out working, uh, but I work at home, and a few blocks over from me, a house was being power washed or like they think they were removing a tank, and it was horrible. It was this high, it's like a high pitched leaf blower, like constant, and it was like. I was getting so angry about it, but I have had a, a report due, and it was this intense analysis, 
And I realized, you know, by the afternoon, when I was intensely working, I didn't hear it. So it didn't bother me. But every time I took a break and stood up, I'd get really angry at this noise. <laughs> She's the opposite. I'm really happy when I'm taking a break. But I just found it so interesting that when I was concentrating, I'm very focused and just absorbed in what I was doing. I almost wasn't even hearing it. And I was just getting <coughs> worked up and angry about it. For, I mean, I couldn't stop it. It was going to maybe go for another few days. And it, it was finally, I think, later in the day, I realized just, just accept it. Just don't worry, you say. Hopefully it'll end in a few days. But it's Very just, good. <laughs> it's just all how, how much is perception or how I reacted to it. Mm -hmm. My reaction to it. And it is definitely anicca. It's uh, impermanent. It will stop. It probably stops at night as well. <laughs> it can stop at 4 o'clock. Yes, exactly. <laughs> But that's, it's very good that you're aware of like how your mind reacts and that your mind, when it goes out to that sound, it actually triggers anger. But if you're focused, you don't even hear it. So this is how our mind works. And if we become aware of these things and really stop and, and contemplate that, it's like, oh, this is how it works. I don't have to get angry. I don't have to listen to it. So when you get angry, you also add this second arrow to that. It's like, I don't know if you know the, the Buddhist teachings on the second arrow or the two arrows. Um, so the first arrow, we can't do anything about it. It's just whatever happens that is suffering, basically. Pain in our body, things that happen outside, the noises, um, this, leaf, this um, what is it, leaf blower or what do you say? Power, power washer. <laughs> Uh, whatever uh, that's okay that's maybe dukkha but there's this the second arrow is our mind it's like if we make more of it if we start oh, oh, can't they stop yes of course this is horrible we start talking to ourselves <laughs> then we start to uh, have, have all these negative feelings that's the second arrow and that makes it worse it makes it a lot worse if you can remove that if you can learn to look at things in a different way, then the suffering isn't really that bad. And you can be much more equanimous and with whatever is happening. Yes, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Is there anyone else who wants to say something, add something? Yes, what's your name? Um, I'm Carol, and I guess there were a couple of things. Mm -hmm. um, one is <clears throat> when Nick shared about, you know, the story you told about the day of going to hell, and then you appreciated it. Um, I know for me it's pain, and when pain disappears, then I appreciate what is. And mm -hmm. it doesn't, you know, matter where I'm, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain. Once it it goes away, then I feel this, ah, and oh, this is what it's like. It, it's almost like the em missing that is what brings the comfort, the, the joy, the whatever. Mm -hmm. Then also when Cheryl was talking about the smile, it just reminded me when we started meditating, I had kind of like a big smile on, <laughs> like like this. And then as we were doing the relaxation, I realized, oh, when I'm relaxed, I just have like a smaller smile. It's not the, hi, I'm here <laughs> kind of thing, but it's just that smile of like peace and peacefulness. Mm -hmm. and relaxation so that I have different smiles. So let, let me uh, do the, the first thing first. I'm so sorry. I, I'll t talk about the first thing oh. first. <laughs> so the, when you say, um, yeah, the, the, this pain, then when that's gone. Yeah, absolutely. It's like we never feel so uh, healthy as when we've just been sick and we're just 
uh, healthy again and then we feel far more healthy than normal <laughs> and far more happy <laughs> so so yeah absolutely it, it, it's the contrast that uh, that that's that's very important to notice there and um, with the smiles yes i have noticed that in myself as well actually what you're saying um but there's a smile that needs uh some smiles they actually need some um um uh, some effort to put there in a way even though uh so, so, so yeah you, you you learn it because and then quite often you're also outside with your your vision and you see other people and you know, you're just happy to be there and but when you um relax you still have a, a, a smaller yeah a smaller smile but a more relaxed smile and your all the muscles are are relaxed yeah exactly but it's it's wonderful that you could notice that that's uh, the difference and that, that's what Thank it's all you. about to become mindful of all these things that are happening inside our body how our body and mind reacts to to different things and that's where we can learn mm -hmm. Okay. Venerable, uh, when you mentioned smile, it occurs to me, having spent a few days with you, that you're almost always smiling. Mm. And Am I? <laughs> okay. <laughs> there's a very... I'm not as good at Venerable way. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's just a very friendly demeanor, and I'm, I'm curious if that's something that you put effort into when you're around other people, or if it's more tending to a metta within and it just comes naturally. I think it depends, like with everyone. Um, <laughs> so some, so sometimes, yeah, you have to put some effort in it, and other times it comes naturally. So, uh, but um, I'm also very. I'm, I've only arrived uh, Wednesday, by the way. Um, <laughs> but I'm also very happy to be here and share with the community. And it's it's very lovely to be around. Uh, yeah, spiritual communities actually. Um, I have um, spent a few weeks in uh, in the Dragoon Mountains in Arizona, also in a spiritual community, and it was also really lovely and everybody very friendly and and, and a lot of kindness. Everybody doing kind little things for each other, and um, uh, somebody drove me to the airport. And the first thing I noticed when I entered Tucson Airport was that everybody was like. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, this is different. <laughs> so now what I started to do is to uh, recite to myself with everybody that I saw. It's like, well, may you be happy, healthy, and peaceful. May you be happy, healthy, and peaceful. And that's a practice that I've taken up since uh, since a few months. Um, since I met a, a, a nun in Amsterdam who uh, who did this practice and who sent us out into the streets of Amsterdam, where it was very very busy uh, to do that with people and to see what the effects were and it was great actually it's like um, yeah uh, but people and also look up and smile back and you've actually made a little bit of a difference in their 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 day um, it, it makes a lot of difference to your own practice actually or to your own uh, how you feel inside as well uh, so yeah, I, I tend to do that almost automatic now. And I went for a walk this afternoon in the reserve here and uh, around the lake, and a lot of people there as well. So and a lot of people. I, I don't know if that's uh, common here, but with where I come from in the cities, people don't tend to say hello to them to each other. But everybody said hello to me, <laughs> or or smiled at me, or smiled back, and so like that was actually really nice. Mm -hmm. So yeah, did take up that practice. It's it's also very helpful. Yes, sorry, cat, <laughs> relying on the on the wire here. <laughs> yeah, you see. Hello. Oh, oh, hello. Sorry. Hello. Um, I'm Carol. Hi, Carol. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for this and uh, your your comment about having a meta practice. I love that and. Um, mm -hmm. I started doing that several months ago. I went to a retreat and we did the Brahma Viharas. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of Vedic practicing. And, and I, it really, really changed um, my outlook and my mind mm -hmm. because it kind of, you know, just instantly. 
really uplifted me uh, and, and kind of calmed down some of the, some of the just, you know, disturbance and annoyance in my mind. Because, you know, that I, I felt like I could, um, you know, approach a situation or a person with loving kindness. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Actually, the I think the Brahma Viharas are very key to our practice. Without um, loving kindness, mindfulness doesn't actually seem work. I mean, this cat can probably sit very uh, mindful uh, near a mouse hole, but uh, yeah, that's not with loving kindness, and that's not the mindfulness that you need for your meditation. Um, so. Every, somehow everything becomes a little bit easier when we can develop this love and kindness. Um, although in its suttas, um, love and kindness is seen as the, the antidote towards anger. Um, I think also probably uh, all kinds of negativity that we might have in our mind. Uh, and that's very powerful because when you don't have this, this we, we have a, a, Especially in, in our um, society, we have get such a fault-finding mind from the day we get born. We are being, uh, uh, being conditioned to look for what's wrong and how to fix it. Um, and you have to always be better in school and you have to, when you finish school, you have to be better there. You, you constantly have to, uh, it's very competitive and we constantly have to be better. And so that's actually a, a, a very negative thing because we're always looking for something what's wrong. And with the Brahma Viharas, we become more in the present moment, become more, um, yeah, just accepting of what is. And yeah, it's okay. It, and we can just have this love and kindness towards ourselves and to other people. Uh, they're also just struggling and trying their best and they might not always do what we want. But we probably also don't always do what they want. <laughs> so they probably also get upset with us. So, uh, it, it, we make our, our own lives a whole lot easier when we practice the Brahma Vihara on a regular basis. Uh, we, we just feel better in ourselves and our relationships to other people start to improve as well. Anyone else who wants to say something? Otherwise, I suggest we just sit quietly for another five minutes. I really do have a, <coughs> a bit of a question. Um, yeah, sure. Sorry. Okay. So I'm not a very visual person. Mm -hmm. um, very much language and, and sound. So mm -hmm. um, things like the Brahma Vihadas, I think for a lot of people I found who enjoy them they're very visual there's a lot of visualization or sometimes it's not specific visualization but it's a very brings up certain kind of visual associations with like light or um i don't know like an expansive kind of some kind of visual mental phenomena mm -hmm. um that i have a hard time relating to and i'm wondering if you have any comments or maybe um or kind of uh, advice on relating to those practices without mm. the visual component. It, uh, you, you started talking, I thought you were talking about like, um, when I said, um, yeah, think of all the people here in your family, etc. Mm. Uh, Ajahn Brahm does a, a cat meta meditation <laughs> that starts with, like think of a, that you find a small kitten, etc. So yeah, it's all visual and all uh, imagining things. Uh, uh, because I think most people are probably visual, uh, mm. so yeah. So, um, how to relate to it with a bit more when, when visual is. Um, how about feeling? Okay, that's not sound, but how, how does this feel? Uh, because uh, actually, this path is, is, uh, is a real feely feely path. So, basically, however you're getting into the, this feeling. Of meta, so feeling, there's a feeling inside. So if you can relate to that, 
then that would would probably work better for you is just to see inside it's like because for instance when i look in in, in inside I'm, I'm a visual person so i see uh also there's feeling but there's also indeed a um yeah sort of some visual image i can't really describe it it's not like an object or something like that but there's some visual image associated with that um so if you but the main main component is the feeling mm. so if so what, what how does the the feeling relate to you maybe it just says it is a good feeling or maybe you hear a sound with that uh, i'm also wondering it says it's a little bit of a different topic but um the sound of silence might be also be a, a good meditation object for you uh, i don't know if you know it from uh, ajahn sumedho i'm very familiar i haven't practiced mm -hmm. much but i'm very familiar so that might also be a good one for you so with, with all meditation uh med meditations whatever works basically it's like everybody's different everybody needs something different so try out a technique for a while if it really doesn't work then, then try out something different but it's, it's always good also to have like several techniques in your in your basket oh here we go <laughs> um so because you might also need several different techniques for several different um uh, occasions like uh for instance um if you come home and you have a lot of anger then sitting down trying to observe your breath is probably not going to work so then maybe yeah do this meta meditation to counteract the, the anger first of all uh or stay with yourself as your own best friend stay with that feeling where it where it is in the body and be your own best friend staying with that with love and kindness that might be a better option than uh yeah than, than anything else at that moment so just see what works whatever how many um meditation techniques have you have in your toolbox is fine <laughs> all right did you have a question as well oh, no okay <laughs> all right there we are a few minutes of meditation <laughs> 